2006, an unexpected war erupts between Israel and Hezbollah. 15,000 Americans are trapped in Lebanon. U.S. Marines come to the rescue, but they need a nearby neutral destination to deposit the frightened American refugees. The island Republic of Cyprus, just 60 miles off the Lebanese coast, is the obvious answer. The Republic of Cyprus opens its arms to its American friends. And the Cypriot government very quickly arranged accommodations for 15,000 people in one week. They put them up until they could get on their way back to the United States or to other parts of the world. So we were enormously grateful to the Cypriot government for what they did in a real crisis, in an hour of need, our need. They came through. They showed that they were good friends, and we won't forget that. But past U.S. policy towards Cyprus demonstrates otherwise. In a recently declassified 1974 State Department memorandum, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger stated, there is no American reason why the Turks should not have one-third of Cyprus. Summer 1974. Turkish forces invade with U.S. supplied arms and occupy one-third of Cyprus. Four minutes past six, and the first of the Turkish troops have landed in Cyprus. About five of these aircraft passed over in the last five minutes. They were guided in by jet fighters, and the very first paratroopers are now hitting Cyprus soil. According to the findings and judgment of the European Court of Human Rights of the Council of Europe, a substantial number of Greek Cypriot civilians were killed. Archbishop Makarios, president of Cyprus in 1974, listed the dead. The number of people in το σπίτι μα είναι στην Κερίνια, μένουμε στην Κερίνια. Όταν έγινε η εισβολή, μείναμε στο σπίτι μα τέσσερι μέρε, αλλά αναγκαστήκαμε να πάμε στο ξενοδοχείο Ντόου, όπου βρήκαμε άλλα 800 πρόσωπα. Εκεί έμειναμε εγκλωβισμένοι, κλειστή όλη μέρα. Turkish troops take over the northern third of the island and continue to occupy that region to this day. Many observers believe the United States had the knowledge and power to prevent the Turkish invasion and later to compel Turkey to withdraw its troops. But the U.S. did neither of those things. It was a clear violation of the rule of law. It was an aggression. It was a trampling on, uh, on, 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 uh, on human rights. It was uh, wiping out, you know, democratic values. The United States uh, should have uh, exerted more pressure on, uh, on Europe, the members of the European Union, uh, to, to act, to put pressure on, on Turkey. Why did the United States fail to act? The answer lies in a tangled web of U.S. domestic politics, the real politic of Henry Kissinger, and the repeated refusal of successive U.S. presidents to demand that the rule of law and fundamental human rights be upheld in Cyprus. While U.S. politicians evaded the issue, Cyprus suffered. <laughs> Δεν ξέρω που είναι. Είναι αγνοούμενος. Γεια μου, παιδιά μου. Αφού είναι τώρα, γίνεται να περάσω το γιο μου, παιδιά μου. Αν είστε με ένα πάμε. 
Ποια σαν μονάκριση και μετά την ανάκριση, ναι. πήραμε και κοιμήθηκα. Ναι. Ήταν και ξυπνούσαμε, παρέ, η ώρα ναι. δεκάμιση. Ναι. Και ανταγώσαμε μόχ στήλων και μας χειρώσαμε στο πλευρό τα χαμένα. Πώς είστε το μωράκια. Μήπως είδατε το γιο μας. Μα δεν έχουμε καθόλου πληροφορίες γιατί είναι γνώμη. Αυτό είναι περισσότερο από ό,τι έχουμε. Modern Cyprus remains a divided island. Its capital, Nicosia, a divided city. We landed at the airport in Nicosia. It was around 10 o'clock in the evening, at night. Uh, my father-in-law came and picked us up from the airport. And we drove, we drove through the Greek Cypriot part of Nicosia. It was a beautiful city, lights everywhere, people going around, uh, bars, uh, open cafes, uh, and I thought, God, it's beautiful. And then we came to the checkpoint where the two sides were separated. And when we crossed over to the Turkish Cypriot side, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was dark. It was like suddenly in a, in a matter of seconds uh, from 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 a lighting area you you just moved into a dark area uh, no cars no people uh, nothing moving i mean it was like a a place a derelict place the economy of the turkish controlled north has stagnated while the economy of the Republic of Cyprus has thrived. Tourists from around the world flock to the lush beaches of Limassol, to the urbane shops and cafes of Nicosia, to the wondrous ruins of the ancient city of Kurion. There is a magic in the air in Cyprus. Some pull to the Cypriot earth. There's a presence of a huge storehouse of the common treasury of civilization involved there. The mythical birthplace of Aphrodite and Adonis, Cyprus was first settled by mainland Greeks in 1600 BC, thus establishing the island's predominantly Greek character, which has been maintained to this day. The Turkish Cypriot minority descends from the Ottomans, who invaded Cyprus in the late 16th century. As 19th century nationalism cascaded over the decaying Ottoman Empire, the Greeks of Cyprus expected to be united with Greece, which had become a modern state in 1830. Instead, the Ottoman Emperor handed Cyprus over to Great Britain. With the Turkish Cypriots, you know, we have lived for uh, over 400 years. And, uh, you know, only a very small fraction of that period, from 1571 until today, was a period of, uh, let's say, friction. After the Second World War, a movement to unite with Greece, known as Enosis, swept over Cyprus. By the 1950s, this movement erupted into armed conflict between Greek Cypriots and British colonial forces. Seeking help in the struggle, the British created allies within the Turkish Cypriot minority by exploiting their concern about Enosis. Centuries of peaceful coexistence collapsed as Turkish Cypriots battled against Greek Cypriots. The Turks now demanded partition of the island to protect their rights. The shooting ended in 1959 with the signing of the London-Zurich Agreement, which granted Cyprus a form of independence from Great Britain in 1960. The basic terms of the Constitution excluded partition and enosis. Archbishop Makarios, who led the Greek Cypriots through the 1950s, was elected the first president the Turkish Cypriot leader, Dr. Fazil Kuchuk, was elected the vice president. 
The Turkish Cypriot minority was given considerable veto and administrative power. Great Britain, Greece, and Turkey guaranteed this independence and governing structure. Although fighting had ceased, animosities continued to simmer. The enmity of Cyprus with the Greeks ήταν ανέκαθεν ο εθνικός πόθος των Ελλήνων Κυπρίων, ένας πόθος βαθιά κρυζωμένος μέσα τους. Και εγώ πολλές φορές μίλησα για την Ένωση, ύστερα από τις συμφωνίες Ζερίχης, διερμηνεύοντας ακριβώς αυτό τον πόθο. Ετώνιζα όμως πάντοτε πως το ευθέον δεν είναι πάντοτε εφικτόν και ότι η Ένωση δεν πραγματοποιείται εφόσον αντιτίθεται προς τούτο η Τουρκία. By 1963, the Constitution had rendered the Cypriot government ineffective. The Turkish minority used its power of veto to stall legislation. President Makarios proposed amendments to eliminate the Turkish veto. Θα έλεγα ότι οι ρίζες της διεχόνοιας μεταξύ Ελλήνων και Τούρκων της Κύπρου ήσαν μέσα στο σύνταγμα μας, το οποίο περιείχε πολλά διαρετικά στοιχεία. The Turkish Cypriots then withdrew from the government and once again intercommunal violence erupted. Turkey threatened to invade Cyprus. Και πολύ περισσότερο οφείλεται βέβαια στο γεγονός ότι η Τουρκία είχε εξ αρχής κατακτητικά σχέδια και βλέψεις και απέτρεπε τους τουρκοκυπρίους από την συνεργασία με τους Έλληνας μέσα στα πλαίσια του συντάγματος. The invasion was averted by President Lyndon B. Johnson. Tension in the eastern Mediterranean and the threat of war between Greece and Turkey brought the evacuation of American, British and UN dependents from the disputed island of Cyprus. NATO Secretary General Senior Brozio and President Johnson's special envoy Cyrus Vance also talked with Greek and Turkish leaders. Turkey was warned that there could be consequences of using U.S. supplied military equipment against Cyprus. In 1967, Greece, a right-wing military junta led by Greek army colonels, overthrows the democratically elected Greek government. This junta reignites the fervor for Enosis. For the next seven years, President Makarios walks a thin line to maintain Cyprus as an independent republic. But in 1974, using extreme Greek Cypriot nationalists, the Greek junta overthrew Archbishop Makarios and attempted to assassinate him. He survived the attempt. In the day of the 25th of July, I was in the office of my office at 8 o'clock. My first priests would have been a group of children από το Κάιρο, που ήρθαν στην Κύπρο ως φιλοξενούμενοι μου. Γύρω στις 8 και 20 περίπου, με ειδοποίησαν ότι τα παιδιά είναι στο σαλόνι. Ο επικεφαλής της ομάδος άρχισε να με προσφωνεί από χειρογράφου. Είπε μερικά λόγια και άρχισαν οι πυροβολισμοί. Οπότε έφτασε κάποιος από την προεδρική φρουρά για να μου πει ότι τεθωρακισμένα και τάγκς ήσαν μπροστά στην είσοδο και άρχισε η επίθεση κατά του Προεδρικού Μεγάρου. Μερικοί φίλοι εκεί με συνεβούλευσαν να εγκαταλείψω την Κύπρο. Δεν είχα όμως μέχρι τη στιγμή εκείνη σκεφτεί ένα τέτοιο πράγμα και η πρώτη μου αντίδραση ήταν αρνητική. Δεν ήθελα να φύγω από την Κύπρο και να νομίσει ο λαός ότι τον εγκατέλειψα και έφυγα για να σώσω τη ζωή μου. Τελικά όμως και αφού ακούστησαν πολλά επιχειρήματα επίστηκα πως ήταν το καλύτερο να φύγω από την Κύπρο ώστε εκτός Κύπρου ελεύθερος να μπορώ να εργαστώ εναντίον των πραξικοπηματιών. As the United States stood by, 
the junta quickly replaced President Macarios with Nikos Samson, known primarily as a right-wing extremist who had allegedly killed 12 people during ethnic clashes in Nicosia. Samson believed he had restored peace and order to Cyprus. But the real storm had yet to strike. I think the idea of some of the colonels anyway in Athens was to incorporate Cyprus into Greece. Uh, this, needless to say, had exercised the Turkish population uh, and Turkey itself. And so that led to a lot of tension. Five days later, on July 20th, Turkey invaded Cyprus. Before the first days of the Praxicomium, and we thought that we would have a little bit, the Turkish invasion started, and then we saw the Praxicomium to fly immediately from the traumas, having the traumas from all the roads and all the roads. We saw the roads with bombs, with bombs, with bombs. The Praxicomium fell, we fell the roads, we took it all over, and 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 we took it all over. I think the U.S., if it had moved, could have prevented the coup by Samson, uh, which the junta in Athens was behind. And had they prevented that coup, uh, Makarios would have continued as the president. And I think it would be much more problematic that Turkey would have found the pretext. The Turkish pretext was to protect the independence of Cyprus. The London-Zurich Agreement allowed Turkey, Greece, or Great Britain to take action against any threat to this independence. The Turkish invasion clearly went much further. Tatino Loizithu was living in the port city of Kyrenia when Turkish forces landed on the beachhead in 1974. Uh, I grew up in Kyrenia. Uh, my parents, my father comes from Kyrenia, and uh, I grew up in Kyrenia, which is on the northern part of Cyprus, in a lovely setting between the sea and the mountains. Using arms supplied by the U.S., Turkish forces managed to overcome the stiff resistance of the tiny Cypriot National Guard in and around Karinia, and occupied a narrow corridor linking Karinia to the Turkish Cypriot enclave in Nicosia. Terrified Greek Cypriots fled south. They drove the Greek Cypriot population from the north to the south systematically sometimes through terror, sometimes just through pushing, sometimes through putting them on buses and driving them across to the line. Greek Cypriots were feeling that they were being pushed out of their land in the north, which they were, uh, because the, the Turks had gotten quite uh, spirited in protecting their territory, even though the Greeks owned a good bit of it. When I got married, I could not settle in Kyrenia, uh, where um, we could have had our uh, home uh, built. Uh, so we settled in Nicosia in anticipation to go back to uh, Kyrenia when uh, the political situation would have allowed us to go back and forth to Kyrenia um, in the in a short time. Within three days of the Turkish invasion, both the Greek junta in Athens and its puppet regime in Cyprus collapsed. The successor to President Makarios, Glavkos Kleridis, took office. So, of course, when, when in 1974 this dictatorship collapsed, I was delighted, as all my Greek friends were. But I realized that a terrible price had been paid for this emancipation, this liberation of Greece, and the price had been paid by Cyprus. That it was only because of the mad adventure of the colonels in their attempt to overthrow Archbishop Macarius that um, Greece was once again free. That seemed a very high price to pay. A ceasefire mandated by the UN Security Council was arranged. From July 25th to July 31st, the UK, Greece, and Turkey 
met in Geneva to discuss the invasion amidst strong fears that Turkey would launch a second, more powerful offensive. Critics say the United States did little to restrain Turkey. We needed to send a strong signal to Turkey that they couldn't just move without there being some consequences that would be associated with that as a, as a, a check or an inhibition on, on Turkish action because they struck in there and they moved troops in and of course then they paused. British Foreign Secretary James Callaghan led the Geneva peace talks attended by U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Arthur Hartman. It was quite clear from those meetings that there was sort of no understanding and um, Callahan talked to me about, you know, can you Americans stop this second invasion, which it looks like it's about to take place. On August 14th, they resumed their offensive, and that's, of course, when they occupied over a third of, of the island and when uh, you had 200,000 refugees as a, as a consequence. Uh, that was a disaster. I mean, they were in Geneva uh, engaged in talks under Callahan's chairmanship, the Greeks and the Turks, and then the Turks launched this attack early in the morning. They were in late the night before trying to, to work out, you know, a peaceful resolution of the matter. There's an eerie silence about the once thriving town. Certainly the Greek Cypriots who make up four-fifths of its population appear to have given up hope of keeping it out of Turkish hands. At first light the Turkish jets bombed it, adding to the damage caused by similar attacks three weeks ago. They hit empty office blocks and deserted apartments. Whatever the Greek resistance may be in the face of the advancing Turks to the northwest of the city, there's none apparent in Famagusta itself. The second offensive was as brutal as feared. Turkey occupied the northern one-third of Cyprus. Hundreds of young Greek Cypriot men were rounded up and never heard from again. It was a situation of uh, immense gloom and tragedy. If you use the term Greek tragedy, it fitted absolutely to think that uh, half the population of the island were pushed out of their houses, out of their homes. They became refugees and they crossed from the Turkish occupied north to the, what became the Greek Cypriot controlled south. Many of them, it was summertime at the time, some of them came over with their swimming trunks and nothing else. <laughs> As the Cyprus crisis unfolded in that summer of 1974, another crisis was reaching its climax in Washington. Watergate. There was a cancer growing on the presidency, and if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. The executive branch was completely caught up in the Nixon departure from the presidency. I actually was on the House Judiciary Committee, which, which voted the articles of impeachment against Richard Nixon. Nixon was just about to go down the tube at that point. Um, and it was quite clear to me from afar that there was no way of getting the American government's attention for something as serious as intervening uh, in Cyprus to stop a second invasion. Hartman, representing America's interests at the Geneva Peace Talks, says he could barely get the ear of his boss, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. In retrospect, he thinks he understands why. Uh, looking back at some of the memoirs, he was on his knees with Nixon in the, in the Oval Office. At virtually the time I was in Cyprus, so he did not have much of his attention focused on what the hell I was doing out there. But in Washington, State Department officials did hear from Kissinger. Dr. Kissinger removed me from my position as the head of the Cyprus 
operation uh, shortly after the invasion. So I cannot speak to that from firsthand experience. But I recommended that to, to Dr. Kissinger that he use his considerable influence to keep the Turkish army in the enclave where they were originally before they drove to both coasts. And we obviously did not bring enough pressure to achieve that because they did break out of the Kyrenia pocket and their tanks went to both coasts, thus dividing the island in half. Some analysts of the era conclude that Kissinger refrained from restraining Turkey's second offensive because he preferred partition as the ultimate solution. It's difficult to encapsulate the wickedness of Kissinger's role in a sentence, but if you wanted to try for an epigram, it would be to support the Greeks as long as they were fascists, uh, to turn against them only when they were Democrats, uh, to support the Turks only when they were aggressors. Um, and to end up with a country ruined and partitioned, which I have to believe was in fact the objective of the policy in the first place. My suspicion is that given Kissinger's orientation, his practice of realpolitik, his belief that Turkey was a vital regional power and an important ally in NATO, led him to sacrifice Cyprus to Turkey that it was important to keep Turkey happy, not alienate the Turkish military especially, and that therefore this was an occasion where the United States just needed to look the other way with regard to this act of aggression. Of course, Kissinger had a, you know, he comes with a very sort of geostrategic view of how the world works, and in that view, uh, Turkey always loomed important to him as it, as it has tended to do in the, in the minds of our military and intelligence people over, over the years. Uh, so I think he was, uh, he was reluctant, I think, to, to, to move as uh, firmly and resolutely against Turkey to check them uh, from, from taking these, these actions. Um, as a consequence, we are then confronted with this um, incredible difficult situation which we have not been able to undo and resolve even to this day. Kissinger in his memoirs denies encouraging the second offensive but says he was distracted by the political crisis at home. Neither Callahan nor I had expected the second Turkish military move and during the crucial four days of the political negotiations my days and to an even greater degree, my emotions were focused on easing Nixon's travail and preparing for the transition to Ford. However, a recently declassified memorandum quotes Henry Kissinger saying that he not only expected the second Turkish invasion, but actually endorsed it. Some of my colleagues want to cut off assistance to Turkey. That would be a disaster. There is no American reason why the Turks should not have one-third of Cyprus. Kissinger's failure to exercise any meaningful effort to restrain the Turkish invasion was not lost on the Greek Cypriot population, who expressed their fury in a mock funeral of the U.S. Secretary of State. Greek Cypriot officials of the time were also angered, adamant in their belief that the U.S. could have saved them from Turkish occupation. Another recently declassified State Department memorandum lends credence to the theory that Kissinger was deliberately passive. Helmut Sonnenfeld, a senior counselor to Kissinger, advised his boss to remain silent until the fighting in Cyprus had stopped. 
He advised that the U.S. should privately assure Turkey that we would get them a solution involving one-third of the island with some kind of federal arrangement. A map which projected Turkish military moves and dated one day before the second Turkish invasion was available to Kissinger from the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research. Back in the United States, a storm was brewing over the Nixon and Ford administration's involvement, or lack of it, in the Cyprus crisis. The Los Angeles Times charged that Kissinger knew in advance of the Turkish plan to invade Cyprus in July and had rejected an appeal from U.S. Ambassador to Greece Henry Tosca to use the U.S. Sixth Fleet to stop the invasion. The New York Times accused the State Department of clearly stalling and bluntly charged that the American unwillingness to condemn the Greek junta's coup had encouraged Turkey to intervene on the island. The editorial also declared that cutting off aid to Turkey was mandatory under the law due to Turkey's use of U.S. arms and equipment for offensive purposes. In Congress, members heard from angry constituents outraged by Turkey's aggressive use of American weapons against Cyprus. A movement quickly grew to cut off any further military aid to Turkey as required by U.S. law. I think at the heart of the matter was the failure of the executive branch of the President and the Secretary of State to enforce the law because American law provided that arms that were made available to another country be used solely for defensive purposes. We undertook an effort in the Congress and across the country to marshal sentiment. Uh, at the time, we concluded that the one thing that we might do that would really send a very strong and sharp signal uh, was a cutoff of uh, military uh, assistance to Turkey. Our argument was essentially that the law at the time required that. Uh, the administration didn't accept that. The Ford administration bitterly opposed the arms embargo. Secretary of State Kissinger said that it would deprive the U.S. of diplomatic flexibility. Kissinger later wrote in his memoirs that he stressed with futility that the proposed aid cutoff would hurt the Greek cause because it would delay, if not prevent, Turkish concessions while the situation was still fluid. But in late 1974, Congress passed legislation cutting off aid to the Turkish military, including equipment for which Turkey had already paid. President Ford reluctantly signed the measure, known as the Rule of Law Arms Embargo. Its sponsors considered the embargo a major moral victory for American foreign policy. The morality and the justice of this cause are so clear that what's really at stake are very basic principles with respect to the American foreign policy. And I always said to groups, because you know, we would get this charge about, quote, the Greek lobby, unquote, this was really an American lobby for American principles and American values that uh, many in this country regard as fundamental to how we conduct our foreign policy. Unfortunately, Washington's actions did little to improve the situation on the ground in Cyprus. An estimated 170,000 Greek Cypriots were forced from their homes and businesses in the north. Turkey began a rapid resettlement reportedly bringing over 1,500 settlers a week from Turkey in violation of the Geneva Convention. You find Turkish settlers from the deep Anatolian plateau who don't dress in modern clothes, whose whole viewpoint is rather on the medieval side. And those people, some of them are from minority groups inside Turkey, and Turkey has put pressure on them to get out. <laughs> to go someplace else. They're changing the culture of the North, and if you get Turkish Cypriots to speak honestly to, to you, they worry about being absorbed into Turkish politics, and the North really is controlled by the Turkish army. Greek Cypriot homes and property were taken and handed over to the settlers and Turkish Cypriots. 
To date, more than 160,000 Turks have been settled in northern Cyprus. A year after the Turks invaded, a group of displaced women formed a protest march called Women Walk Home for a United Cyprus. Tatina Loezidu joined this march. A group of women uh, decided to demonstrate uh, the fact that uh, women could not go back to their homes. So uh, we mobilized about 30,000 women who, uh, in a very peaceful way, started marching towards Famagusta. The idea was to go into the occupied part, to walk home to Famagusta, uh, which is a city under Turkish occupation since 1974. It's a city which was abandoned. Uh, well, its inhabitants fled as the Turkish troops were entering. And uh, uh, it's a city which is a ghost town. And uh, by walking there, we wanted to say we come home. So the United Nations who are in Cyprus a peacekeeping force, they are in between the Turkish invading uh, troops and the free area of the Republic, stopped us and we could not go further. A solution to the Cyprus problem has remained elusive. The apparent indifference of the United States to the illegal Turkish occupation has remained constant with the exception of the rule of law arms embargo imposed by Congress. But soon after the election of Jimmy Carter, even that was short-lived. President Carter asked us to lift the arms embargo on Turkey. I think he was obviously, he must have been under pressure from uh, some of the people in the Department of Defense or elsewhere. And uh, as there had been no advance whatsoever uh, on removing uh, Turkish troops from Cyprus or Turkish settlers from Cyprus. I think once he got in there, there was a lot of pressure that came to bear from the the security establishment within the government, the Pentagon, the intelligence community, and so forth. We had these listening facilities in Turkey that were directed towards the, the Soviet Union. Um, that security establishment has always given a high geostrategic value to Turkey and it given its location and so forth. Despite a campaign pledge to find a Cyprus solution based on the rule of law, once in office, Jimmy Carter called the repeal of the embargo his highest foreign policy priority. After close votes in the House and Senate, the embargo was indeed lifted in the fall of 1978. This despite the fact that Turkey still occupied nearly 40% of Cyprus. Turkey's access to U.S. arms was fully restored. In 1983, with its military still occupying the northern third of the island, Turkey created the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. The UN Security Council, European Union, and United States Congress all immediately condemned the action. The Turkish Northern Republic is recognized only by Turkey. The rest of the world recognizes the sovereignty of the Republic of Cyprus over the entire island. Since the 1980s, while on the campaign trail, one presidential candidate after another expressed the urgency of solving the Cyprus issue. But once elected to office, the president relegates the issue to mid-level bureaucrats, where it languishes. Nevertheless, people affected by the issue continued to make their voices heard. In the last March of uh, March 89, uh, actually it was called the Journey to Freedom. 
I was seized by the Turkish troops and then detained for uh, 10 hours, along with other women. Being unarmed, obviously, we were no threat. It was very ironic that uh, within our country we were seized uh, for violating <laughs> or trespassing uh, the so-called Turkish Northern Republic of uh, Cyprus, which is uh, controlled by the Turkish uh, troops. Most uh, officials in Washington uh, simply wish the Cyprus problem would uh, go not only on the back burner but off the stove entirely. Uh, they, they don't want to deal with the problem. It, it brings up a lot of unpleasant issues. It creates tensions in the relationship between Washington and Ankara. A major legal victory occurred in the mid-1990s when the European Court of Human Rights of the Council of Europe rendered judgments in favor of displaced Greek Cypriots. A few weeks after, I found out that uh, Turkey had signed uh, Article 25, which allowed individuals to file applications uh, f uh, for deprivation of human rights. And uh, I felt that this was uh, a good opportunity for me to express uh, my um, uh, wish that uh, I would be restored my human right to be in Kyrenia, where I come from. I found out that, uh, I felt that uh, um, uh, the property I had in Kyrenia uh, reflected my life in Kyrenia. Uh, it reflected my uh, family life, uh, not only my family life, but uh, the quality of being in the place where I grew up and I wanted to be. The court ruled that Turkey has illegally excluded the rightful owners from their property in Turkish occupied Cyprus. Because it is a member of the Council of Europe, Turkey is bound by the court's decision. The decision of the court was that uh, Turkey uh, is responsible for whatever is happening in the northern part of Cyprus because Turkey exercises full control with the presence of 40,000 troops. The court awarded to Tina Loezidu over $1 million in compensation for the loss of the use of her property in Karina. I felt very pleased. I felt pleased um, that this case did not only uh, reflect um, uh, uh, justice, uh, but uh, also I was pleased that uh, uh, Cypriots could uh, see the future uh, uh, bringing justice to, to Cyprus. I felt that um, uh, I was very pleased that the, a system allowed me to come as far as having a, a judgment. Tatina's case has paved the way for similar judgments in other property disputes. They want to go back to their homes. Many of them would actually go back to a small piece of land as long as they had sort of a pied à terre where they could, where they, they, they could live. People have lost their homes. People have lost, have had uh, their assets. Uh, taken away from them. People have had to live not knowing whether they'd ever be able to return home. And I know that a lot of people here in the United States feel that pain. I, I feel it in my Cypriot American friends. In 2002, with active U.S. and British participation, U.N. Secretary General Kofi Annan brought together representatives from both Cypriot communities to negotiate a plan for peace. Two years of negotiation and five drafts later, the Anan plan was put to a nationwide vote. The Turkish Cypriots approved the Anan plan, while the Greek Cypriots rejected it. Significantly, the Anan plan was voted down by a two-thirds majority of all Cypriots. The Greek Cypriots weren't offered anything by the Anan plan. 
they were being asked to risk everything in a sense for a perhaps a maybe uh, and a part of a perhaps and a maybe. The Turkish Cypriots were offered the world, basically. The Greek Cypriots were offered not much at all. Well, the Anand plan uh, looked very much like a cobbled together uh, device to try to give the illusion that the Cyprus problem was being solved without the problem actually being solved. The Greek Cypriots, for the most part, were asked to make major concessions uh, up front and in terms of very real substance in exchange for largely theoretical possible future concessions on the part of the Turkish Cypriot side and, uh, more importantly, on the part of the Turkish government. The problem is not the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots. The problem is Turkey, actually. If the Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots had been allowed to negotiate a, a deal between them, I think they would have resolved the problem by now. The former president of uh, the Turkish administration in the north, Rauf Denktash, was more interested in being a Turkish politician than a Turkish Cypriot politician. So he played the game by getting Turkey on his side and he also tried to prolong the stay of the Turkish army in Cyprus, which the Turkish army um, wanted to happen. I mean, the Turkish army likes occupying Cyprus. We are not uh, saying that Turkish military will stay uh, here in the island, but we are saying that with a solution uh, they will go. Turkish troops were going to remain in Cyprus indefinitely. There was no provision for having those troops or even a major portion of that occupation force to withdraw as part of the settlement. And uh, it was hardly surprising that Greek Cypriot voters rejected that settlement. In 2004, the Republic of Cyprus became a full member of the European Union. This has created a real possibility of a settlement for one simple reason. Turkey aspires to join the EU as well, and each EU member must consent to the membership of Turkey. Probably the most significant leverage there is on Turkish behavior is their desire to enter the EU, and therefore the EU is in a position as some significant forces in the EU have asserted uh, that Turkey has to do a number of things to warrant EU membership, and one of them is to peacefully resolve the situation in Cyprus. The Cypriot strategy of getting into the European Union was nothing short of brilliant. Uh, not only did they highlight uh, the importance of Cyprus as a vibrant economic player that this would be a useful addition to the European Union. They made an, a compelling moral case that they would be able to meet all of the criteria set out by the European Union for membership and would be able to do so within a relatively short period of time and that they should not be punished simply because Turkey had committed an act of aggression and continued to occupy 37% of Cypriot territory. I think it obviously, in my view, absurd on the face of it that a European Union member m should militarily occupy another member of the European Union and, second, refuse to accord it diplomatic recognition. With the prospect of entry into the EU, Turkey stands at one of the most significant crossroads in its history. Turkey is going to be disappointed ultimately if it believes it can get into the European Union on its own terms and especially if it assumes that it can get in while it continues to occupy Cyprus. That is just not going to happen. Turkey uh, is faced now more and more with a very sharp choice to make. It can modernize itself, it can Europeanize itself, it can democratize itself and it can retain its secular character um, or it can fall back into some version of Ottomanism or theocracy and rejoin the ranks of the backward nations. 
After more than three decades of turmoil, the elements of a solution are in place. The question then becomes whether there is a constructive role for a future U.S. administration. The problem now is who is going to play the role of a third-party mediator with the U.N. having tried and failed if the United States does not play that role. Uh, I, I suppose, in a sense, the Europeans will be working on that issue. But I think it would make a much stronger situation internationally if we were to work with the Europeans and come up with some kind of a structure and try to sell it to both sides. If there is not much influence exerted on, on Ankara, on the military, I don't see any change uh, happening. So we do rely on the United States because the United States is the only country that can exercise uh, their influence on Turkey, to exercise a leverage on Turkey. My approach would be to uh, be very candid with the Turkish government, that this is an obstacle to continued close cooperation between the United States and Turkey, um, that if Turkey expects the United States to really uh, weigh in with uh, its friends in the European Union to treat Turkey's candidacy for admission very seriously, then the Cyprus issue has to be solved and solved equitably. That we simply will not try to muscle the European Union on Turkey's membership while Turkey continues to occupy a significant part of the territory of its neighbors. Be very candid about that that the days of Henry Kissinger's willingness to look the other way are over. Although the U.S. has allowed its credibility as an honest broker in the Cyprus issue to erode, it may still perform a constructive role by affirming its commitment to the rule of law. I think we have seen almost two generations of American policymakers now that if it is a choice between standing up for moral principles standing up for the rights of the Cypriot population or placating Ankara, the United States will opt to placate Ankara every single time. When it lifted the arms embargo on Turkey in 1978, Congress enacted legislation which remains law to this day. It sets forth principles guiding U.S. policy in Cyprus for a just settlement. These principles include establishing a free and independent government, guaranteeing the protection of human rights, and the withdrawal of Turkish military forces from Cyprus. During the Cold War, President Eisenhower stated that there can be no peace without law, and there can be no law if we were to invoke one code of international conduct for those who oppose us, and another for our friends. The interests, the self-interest of the United States, if you want to call it that, I don't mind. The real policy, if you prefer. All of this, plus the importance of Cyprus to the integrity of the principles of the European Union, which is also surely in the national interest of the United States. All of these press in one direction. The withdrawal of the occupiers, <clears throat> the right of Cyprus to self-determination. Well, Cyprus uh, is important to the United States because it's a friendly country. and. Um, and, and, and it's so much tied up in the politics of the last three decades. It's really extraordinary that there hasn't been a solution to the Cyprus problem now uh, in 40, 45 years. And it's important to us because we want to try to achieve a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace, stable and united. And that won't happen until the dividing lines have been erased in Cyprus, until justice has been done, until the conflict has been resolved. By abandoning the rule of law and its principles, the U.S. had a role in causing the present division of Cyprus. It remains to be seen whether the U.S. can perform a role in reunifying Cyprus. The status quo is not an option for us uh, because it is not uh, for our benefit, uh, not ultimately. Well, I consider Cyprus as a whole and uh, this is how I lived uh, before in Kyrenia, uh, which was a mixed uh, uh, town. And uh, I don't believe that being separated, being separated, uh, can bring peace.
χρόνια από την εισβολή στην Κύπρο και από την όντως βάρβαρη κατοχή ενός τρίτου του προσφυλιστάτος του νησιού μας στην Κύπρο. Εθιμούμε την ημέρα που ακούστηκε το φοβερό νέο του πραξικολίου του στην Κύπρο Ήμουν τότε στην Αθήνα και πολύ σύντομα μετά οι, ακούστηκαν οι ειδήσεις περί εισβολής. Ειδοποιηθήκαμε και περιμέναμε να επιστρατευτούμε ανα πάσα στιγμή προκειμένου κατά πάσα πιθανότητα να μεταφερθούμε στην Κύπρο για να υπερασπίσουμε το νησί μας. Αλλά δεν έγινε αυτό και απλούστητα ότι η ακολούθηση ήταν μια κατάσταση κατοχής η οποία παραμένει επί 40 χρόνια. Επί 40 χρόνια παλεύουμε ηρωικά και εντός της Κύπρου αλλά και εκτός της Κύπρου οι Κύπροι αδελφοί ανά τον κόσμο αλλά μαζί τους και όλοι οι Έλληνες παλεύουμε για να τεθεί τέρμα σε αυτή την τρομακτική αδικία που έχει γίνει. Είχαμε υποσχέσεις, είχαμε δυνατότητες ότι κάτι θα γίνει, αλλά μέχρι στιγμής είναι θα ακόμη εκεί που είμαστε πριν από 40 χρόνια. Αλλά η ελπίδα ποτέ δεν σβήνει. Η ελπίδα δεν σβήνει διότι δεν στηρίζεται στην περίπτωσή μας σε ουτοπικές, φανταστικές, απίθανες καταστάσεις ή δυνατοτήτες. Δεν σβήνει γιατί στηρίζεται στην πίστη μας το Θεό. Το Θεό που είναι Θεός δικαιοσύνης, ελευθερίας και αγάπης. Ένα Θεός δικαιοσύνης ελευθερίας και αγάπης, δεν θα αφήσει ένα λαό να εξεκολουθήσει να είναι τόσο κατάφορα αδικούμενος. Πιστεύουμε και προσευχόμεθα και αγωνιζόμεθα ο Θεός γρήγορα να δώσει τη λύση, ώστε να μην χρειαστεί να περιμένουμε ακόμη μια αλλαγή η οποία θα ήταν υπό άλλες ηθίκες το φυσικότερο πράγμα του κόσμου, μια Κύπρος ενιαία, ενωμένη με τους λαούς της, να κατοικούν με αγάπη, ομόνια και δημιουργικότητα. Ελπίζουμε, διότι πιστεύουμε και επειδή πιστεύουμε, αγωνιζόμαστε και επειδή αγωνιζόμαστε σύν Θεό, είμαστε βέβαιοι ότι θα μας αξιώσει να γιορτάσουμε την ημέρα της δικαιοσύνης, της ελευθερίας και της χαράς της ζωής, η οποία είναι ένα τόσο έντονο χαρακτηριστικό του μεγάλου και ηρωικού και αγαπημένου νησού μας, της Κύπρου. Ο Θεός να είναι μαζί με τους αδελφούς και πλήρους και σήμερα και αύριο και πάντοτε, ως την ημέρα που θα χαράξει η αυγή για την ειρήνη και την δικαιώση των αγώνων.